would want to read a condensed version of that 400 years. Yeah. What would be a good place to start? Yeah. Um, so the first article I gave you uh, on the drama of scripture comes from a book called The Drama of Scripture. Uh -huh. um, and they've got a good section on the intertestamental period. And so that would be just a chapter. And I could photocopy that chapter for you if you wanted. Um, the best book I know, but it's a bit thick, is one called um, Judaism Before Jesus. And that gives a good summary of all of those 400 years before Jesus. Um, so Judaism Before Jesus, that's by a guy named Tony Tomasino. Um, and honestly, one of the best resources you could get is the First Century Study Bible. First Century Study Bible. And that's going to be a study Bible, so it, you know it's a Bible, chapters and verses and all that. But all of the notes and, bu and a bunch of essays are all going to deal with that time period as well. Of where did the Pharisees come from? Where did the Sadducees come from? So it would have Old Testament, intertestamental, and New Testament. It, it would not. It would not have the apocrypha, but it's going to give you all of that history and background. Yeah, first century study Bible. There's another study Bible called. The NIV Background Study Bible. NIV Background Study Bible. And that's probably my favorite study Bible right now. Because uh, it gives, it would talk about um, Rahab and Tiamat, the sea monster, and give some of the background on creation myths and all that kind of stuff. So that's a really good one. Uh, and again, that's the kind of Bible that you get for the essays inside um, that are scattered throughout, as opposed to just reading a, a book about it. You can get it in the context of whatever passage that you're reading. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It might be called Cultural Background Study yeah, Bible. It might be Cultural mm -hmm. Background Study Bible. I just left it up. So, thank you. Oh. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to breeze through. Um, Act 4, so the New Testament, uh, or the Gospels, the, the time of Jesus. So this is climax and resolution, because uh, this is probably the part that we're most familiar about, familiar with. Um, so there's this guy, you don't need to write this down, you don't need to know this, I'm not going to quiz you, uh, named Dionysius Exegesis, Exegesis. Uh, and he's around in the 500s AD. And uh, up to that point, the way that years had been done usually had to do with um, kings. So it's the 15th year of Diocletian. It's the 32nd year of uh, uh, Maximus. It's the, whatever, they're called uh, regnal, regnal years. Um, there was another system that was based off of Judaism, uh, and so instead of Anno Domini in the year of our Lord, A.D., it was, um, oh shoot, I, the word left me, Anno, in the, in the year, Anno Mundo? Yes, Anno Mundo, in the year of the world. And so they had this system that basically put the creation of the world at 4004. Uh, and so when Jesus came, it would be, you know, 2000 and something in the year of the world or whatever. It's a crazy system that didn't make any sense. So uh, Dionysus Exegus uh, comes along and says, what if we created a dating system based off of when Jesus was born? And that's where you get on a Domini, uh, A.D., in the year of our Lord. Um, except um, he intended Jesus to be, we don't know when he intended Jesus to be born. We don't know if it was year 2 B.C., uh, if he started with uh, Jesus in utero, we don't know if it was 1 B.C. In, uh, by the way, there was no zero to somebody in that time period. Zero was a weird Muslim idea that came later. Uh, so it was either 2 or 1 B.C. or 1 A.D. We don't know. He didn't write it down anywhere. Um, but the system began to be adopted uh, in the 700s, a couple hundred years later, by this historian named the Venerable Bede, who Brandon just quoted a couple weeks ago in his sermon. Uh, 
um, and then it became widely adopted in the 11th through 14th centuries. Um, so everyone's trying to figure out when was Jesus born according to Dionysus' uh, system that kind of makes sense, but he didn't make a whole lot of good notes about it. Um, so Jesus was not born in 1 AD, even though that would make sense, um, in the year of our Lord, year 1. Nope, not that. Here's what we know. We know that uh, Herod the Great, died in 4 BC. Uh, and we know that from other historical sources from that time period. We know that Herod, um, in the book of Matthew, calls for the slaughter of the babies of Bethlehem who are two years old and younger, based off of what the Magi, the wise men, uh, told him. So the wise men show up to Herod the Great, um, they wander off to Bethlehem, pay homage to Jesus, who, by the way, I've said this before and I'll say it again, Jesus was not in the manger when the Magi visited. He was a couple years old. Uh, so that means that Jesus was born two years before the birth of Herod, which put the birth of Jesus around 6 BC. I'm sorry, the death of Herod. Birth of Jesus. Two years before the death of Herod. Whoa. When was the slaughter of the... Around babies? here. Oh, okay. When she, Jesus was about to, and Herod died not that long after. Okay. So, birth of Jesus, 6 B.C. There are some arguments for 4 B.C. We're not going to cover those arguments tonight. The majority consensus is 6 B.C. Um, death of Jesus depends on who you read, but based off of when Passover was um, and based over, uh, we know that there were two solar eclipses um, in 30 and 33 AD. Uh, so, in the at three o'clock hour, the world grows dark. There's an earthquake, and Jesus dies. So, I was taught in my seminary thirty. There are plenty of people who think thirty-three. Um, so that's one that's harder to nail down, but somewhere in that thirty to thirty-three um, is when Jesus died, which makes Jesus somewhere around. 36 to 39 years old. Uh, the main thing to say about Act How's 4... That? What's that? How's that? From 6 B.C. to 30 B.C.? It's 36 years. Because B.C. is counting backwards. B.C. counts up. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And 30 years A.D. What do you get? Lost. <laughs> <laughs> Why did they come backwards? Yeah. <laughs> okay, and BC that's... counts from big to small to 80. Oh. So, Jesus is born 6 B.C., and then one year later, it's 5 B.C. Okay. One year later, it's 4 B.C. Now, remember, but if you're a person died. who lives at this time, you don't count like this. We count like this. <laughs> but he died in A.D., not B.C. That's right. So, 6, 5, oh. 4, 3, 2, 1. There is no zero. Okay. Zero is not a concept which is just wild to think about. This is why we have to study the Bible, by the way. Uh, and it's sometimes a little hard, because things like zero, we take for granted. <laughs> Six, five, four, three, two, one. And then you start counting up, one, two, three, four, and et cetera. Okay, I thought you said 30 B.C. Six B.C., born 30 A.D. My mistake, died. sorry. We good? We're good. I know, it's a little mind what is What is B.C.? Uh, before Christ. Okay, it really. I thought that's what it was, it's, but then like 
before Christ, but not really. AD, before, AD is, you know, some people yeah, say exactly. like after death, yeah. but it's not after death. So yeah, yeah. AD. So in uh, Dionysus's system, he named it Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord. He did not have a name for the BC part. That came many centuries later. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and lots of different systems called it lots of different things. In English, we just call it before Christ. Um, so, yeah. You would have called this, if you lived back then, you would have called this uh, Augustus you know, 22 or something like that. The year of yesterday. Yeah, see, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the 22nd year of our great emperor, son of God, uh, Caesar Augustus. That's what you would have called it. From our perspective, we call it 6 BC. So yes, Jesus was alive, you know, one year before Christ. Does it make any sense? No, it's a very flawed system. <laughs> it's a very flawed system. By the way, you may also hear AD called CE. Uh, that stands for Common Era, and that's basically just calling this era something that does not refer to Jesus. That's all. Which I don't. I'm fine using CE. My faith it does not depend on calling it AD. Some people get their panties twisted about it. Whatever. <laughs> and therefore, BCE before the Common Era. Would you <laughs> mind writing out? What AD actually stands for? Anno, yeah. year, Domini, Domini. Lord. Anno, okay. Domini. Domini. And you said that means the year of our Lord? In the year of our Lord. So <laughs> Not after death. <laughs> Is there a session after the session for us to compare notes? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Unwind the spaghetti. <laughs> I'm just curious about the zero that doesn't exist. <laughs> um, you know, like creation for us, that's, you know, prior to, to creation, so there would be nothing. Mm. It's a null set. It's null, yeah, right. I, I don't know how they don't have zero. I have to ask a mathematician. That's why we call them Arabic numerals, by the way, because they came from the Arabs. It was the Muslims, the, Arab, the Arabs, who came up with zero, one, two, three, four, five. They had number systems before that, but it was like, you know, M, C, M, L, X, X. Right. They were using Roman numerals mm -hmm. to convey numeric ideas. And then a Muslim Arabic philosopher came up with, what if there's a zero? But that's a different topic for a different day. <laughs> okay. Um, obviously, we're doing great uh, short shift of Act four. Act four. It's the New Testament. It's the Gospels. It's what happened with Jesus. Um, and like we talked about in the first week in that chapter that I handed you, like the thing to understand is that the New Testament is not doesn't just pop out of a vacuum. It is the result of these hundreds and thousands of years of history, of these messianic expectations of what is Yahweh finally going to do about Rome? And then the bigger question, what is Yahweh finally going to do about sin? What is Yahweh finally going to do about the fact that we got kicked out of the garden? Is he ever going to do something about that? And then along comes Jesus, and he messes and he plays with those expectations. Yes, he goes marching in Jerusalem, but it's on a donkey. Yes, there are palm branches, but he invites the children to play along too. Yes, he's being enthroned, but he's not being enthroned in a temple or a palace. He's being enthroned on a cross. And so he messes with all these expectations and does something. Uh, great and right quote. God has done surprisingly, unexpectedly, um, exactly what he always said he would do. God has this, done yeah, surprisingly and unexpectedly exactly what he always said he was going to do. And that's the story of Jesus. That's Act 4. That's the climax and the resolution of all of the powers of evil, all of the powers of Satan and his minions, all of the power of death um, are met with Jesus on the cross. And then, on the third day, 
resurrection. By the way, let's talk about on the third day. Um, we count days differently than a first century person counts days. Um, Jesus died on a Friday, was entombed on a Saturday, risen on a Sunday. How can you say three days later? Because they count Friday as one of the days. It's an inclusive day counting system. They so count Friday as a what? As one of the days. Uh -huh. So on the third day, one, two, three, Jesus rose again. That's how they counted days. Um, but the Jews also start their day the night before? Would that make would Yeah, that so that Friday, make? he's dead all before sundown. So for all the Friday counts. And then sundown Friday into Saturday, all of Saturday counts. And then after sundown on Sunday, before sunrise, he's risen. That's the third day, on the third day. Um, yeah, this became a big sticking point for my oldest brother, who eventually joined a cult because of this. What? It's true. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. That's, because we can't count. Because <laughs> we count differently. Because <laughs> we count differently. And that was used to him as a proof that you can't trust the, the New Testament. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, okay. We're going to stop there with our acts. Uh, any questions about anything we've covered so far? Okay. Now we're going to talk about how the Bible is put together. Oh, boy. Um, so, when we think about the Bible in the 66 books, uh, it can be easy to um, imagine it like a modern person sitting down to write down a book or to type out a book. Obviously, they weren't typing. Um, but we should even get the idea of writing out of our mind for at least a little bit. The great majority of people in the ancient world were illiterate. They couldn't read, they couldn't write. So the way most things were handed down were through oral tradition, through stories. Exactly. Which meant that their brains were just wired differently than ours. Because they're using different parts of our brains than we use. And this is the thing that comes up in kind of modern educational theory of how do you train students to learn and memorize when no one needs to learn or memorize anything ever again. And our brains are being changed by access to the internet and why we're having these great cultural huge conversations about <coughs> what is truth and fact and fake news and all of that stuff because the way that we gather and get information is completely being changed. Transport yourself 4,000 years ago where there is not even not the internet, there's not a library, books are as rare as gold. How do you transmit information? It's through oral tradition, it's through storytelling. Which meant that people could memorize far more than a modern person could memorize. Uh, even Jews uh, in Jesus' day, uh, the way that you got access to rabbinical school was by memorizing and reciting the entire Tanakh. Genesis 1, the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, all the way through the end of Second Chronicles. Because remember, the order is different. Um, and you would just recite it. And you would know it literally backwards and forwards because you'd have these rabbinical exercises as a student with your rabbi where he would say a verse and you're supposed to say the verse before. And he would say a verse and you're supposed to say the verse after. And you would just know this flat, which to us sounds insane. And it was still a feat. Like, not everybody could make it into rabbinical school, but it wasn't impossible. You could do it. Because this was how you learned everything. You didn't have books to learn from. You had the story. Uh, there's a great, great book called Story of God, Story of Us, which uh, imagines that you're a Babylonian exile. Uh, and you're a child, and your parents or grandparents are telling you the story of what happened to Israel. Um, why are you sitting on the rivers of Babylon? 
um, and you're getting that oral tradition. And it's a really cool small group experience because they have you like set up candles and lanterns and lay down like a pillow for or blankets or whatever, and you just hear the story read, uh, which is you know a very very different uh, experience. So don't immediately think of someone sitting down to write the Bible because it's just not how it worked. You heard it orally. You have heard traditions and stories. Um, then, eventually, that made it up to the learned, the elite, those who had uh, literacy, who could read and write, and not only could read and write, but had access to the tools of reading and writing, papyrus and ink and little quills and all of that stuff. Um, they would gather these oral traditions and begin to write them down. So, there could be an oral tradition that, you know, I've heard it said that there is a God named Yahweh, and he did all of this in six days. So, you would talk about that. And then maybe there was a master storyteller in your story, in your village, and they start arranging the material of, okay, day one, light and there's darkness. Day four, which is symmetrical of day one, he fills the light and the darkness with the sun and the moon. Okay, day two, there's the earth and the, uh, and the water and they're separated. And day five, he fills the earth and he fills the water. And you start getting that kind of thing. That's the composition of these oral traditions that are passed down. Uh, then, eventually, you have these contributors and these editors coming together, telling the oral story, and the editors compiling them into uh, scrolls so that they could be kept. Now, this doesn't have to run completely afoul of the usual way that you might see scripture. Um, Moses, very likely, was one of those editors. Moses, he's uh, raised by Egyptians. He's going to be a learned individual. He learns how to read and to write because he's part of the palace of Egypt. Um, and then he wanders the desert for 40 years. God calls him to call the Hebrews out of Egypt, out of slavery. Um, of course, he's going to start gathering the stories of his people and start writing them down. He's one of the few people who knows how to write. Um, so that's, of course, what Moses is going to do. So I have no issue with saying that Moses probably wrote the majority of the Pentateuch, of Genesis through Deuteronomy. But it's not just like Moses sat down at a desk and God was whispering in his ear. There was a real life, real human thing going on here. Moses is gathering stories, putting it in a certain form, um, maybe listening to the storytellers and compiling all of this information. Now, we see the evidences of this uh, if you, you know, read through First and Second Samuel or read through First and Second Kings where there are those kind of editorial notes. As it says in the book of the Annals of the King, he did many of these great things. As it says in the book of Wars, da, 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 da. as it says in the book of Jasher, all of these books that we don't have access to, they're probably lost at the sands of time, but the editors who are pulling together all these sources are actually quoting their sources in some, in some places. Um, so you have contributors and you have editors. Oral tradition, contributor, editor. Oh, I'm, I'm repeating myself. Oral tradition, contributors, editors, who are pulling all these stories together. Uh, and then eventually what you have is what's called an autograph or a manuscript. The autograph would be the original, full, complete text of a biblical book. Um, so Genesis probably existed as who knows how many different sources, contributors. An editor, possibly Moses, brings it all together, and then there is somewhere, again, lost in the sands of time, an original copy of the thing called Genesis, where someone, Moses, pulls all the stories together, gets them all down on papyrus, boom, you have Genesis. Now what happens? You don't have a printing press. You don't have a photocopier. How do you make sure that Genesis gets from you to your kid to your grandkid? Because it's papyrus. It's going to rot. So what do you do? You have to have somebody rewrite it. You have to have someone rewrite it each and every time. So autographs turn into manuscripts. Wherever the autograph of Genesis is, it is for sure 
destroyed, rotten, gone. But we do have manuscripts. So Moses hands it to the next person who knows how to write, and they make a copy. <coughs> hands it to the next person who knows how to write and they make a copy. And maybe you had multiple copies in a generation because you had five friends who knew how to write so they're all doing the work. But you have manuscript that gets handed on, handed on, handed on. Are you tracking with me so far? Okay. Well, as Judaism, the Jews, the Hebrews spread, that work spreads as well. So, you have the Hebrew copies of the original. That's going to be, you know, the major, most of the work of people who take Genesis written in Hebrew and they write down a copy of Genesis written in Hebrew and they write down a copy uh, written in Hebrew. You have the LXX, which is another word for uh, Septuagint, and that is the version in what language? Greek. 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 Right, because now a large portion of your Jewish Hebrew audience doesn't live in Palestine anymore. They live out in the Greek Empire and eventually the Roman Empire, which, by the way, most Romans spoke Greek. Uh, and so they start making copies of the Greek translation of the, what we call the Old Testament. Over here, you have the DSS, the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls. And again, DSS, that's if you look at your footnotes in your Bible, you might see that from time to time. What's the word underneath Hebrew copies? I'll get to it. Oh, sorry. I'll get to it. <laughs> Don't jump ahead. <laughs> were all those written in the same era or years, or when were they all? Um, okay, good question. Are... The majority of the manuscripts that we have of the Old Testament okay, come from around 1000 AD. They come from a group of Jews called the Masoretes. And so their copies of the Old Testament are called the Masoretic Text. M-A-S-E-R-O-T-I-C. Maser. They were the ones who would write Yod, wash themselves, A, wash themselves. That, that was that group. They were the group that took just pain striking care to copy, reproduce um, the Old Testament. So we have got these manuscripts written on you know, really, really old, old pieces of papyrus and paper. And the, some of the oldest ones that we have, the majority of the oldest ones we have, are the Masoretic texts, 1080. Then, 1947, 48, 49, um, Israel has just become a nation state again. And there is a young shepherd boy wandering around uh, in the area called Qumran, which is this uh, desert area. And uh, he stumbles into a cave, and he opens up, he finds this like perfectly preserved jar, and inside the jar are these very well-preserved papyrus. Um, crazy and painful, he tells his dad, his dad goes, figures out that, man, this is probably really special, goes and takes it to the bazaar, like the flea market, and sells them. So there's a chunk of the Dead Sea Scrolls that we'll never get back. <laughs> Fortunately, some other people find out what's happening, uh, particularly the Jerusalem University, and they send the archaeological teams, and they figured out, like, oh my gosh, we have found manuscripts that come from 100 B.C. So 1,100 years earlier than some of our best previous manuscripts. This is a massive, world-changing, scholarship-changing find in biblical um, studies. Because we had some really good copies, and now we're finding really good copies that are 1,100 years uh, older. So, the big question on everybody's mind is, here's the copies that are 3,000 years removed from... Exodus and Genesis and Deuteronomy, um, and 2,000 years removed from Isaiah and Ezekiel. 
We found copies that are 1,100 years closer. How do they compare? Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> we'll take a bathroom break. So I have a question. Yeah. So like, like when Jesus died, then were they just talking orally all those years before they were actually starting to write the stuff down? Right. Yeah, then we'll talk a little bit about New Testament too. Um, Jesus died, what, 30, 33 AD. Yeah. The first Christian book that we have is Galatians, which is 48 the first, what? the first Christian book, the earliest Christian, Christian? writing is Galatians. And that's oh. 48. That means Paul is writing about Christian faith 18 years after Jesus' death. Oh. Which is really early to have something like that close. Because the same thing holds true. The majority of people are illiterate. They're passing around oral traditions. And we'll talk about this too. But, um, yeah. So there's a picture of one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, there's a variety of caves, and uh, there's a whole system for how you refer to all the different scrolls. Um, but you'd hear like Q1, which refers to Qumran, Cave 1, or Q2, uh, and then the different scrolls that are found within the different caves. Uh, and in the, in the caves, there are like, and again, you're talking 2,100 years old. Entire copies of Isaiah, entire copies of Samuel, entire copies of uh, Joshua um, found that were just perfectly preserved because it was dry, it was desert, there was no moisture, they were in these jars. Um, and yeah, they, they brought back our earliest manuscripts of the OT by a good thousand years. And they were 98% similar to the Masoretic text. Wow. That's 98% similar. That's a miracle. Which means that only copying by hand. Similar to the what? To the Dead Sea Scrolls. Dead Sea Scrolls, oh. Masoretic text, had a 98% similarity. What was similar to them, though? The, oh. yeah, the Masoretic. Thanks. The Masoretes who painstrikingly copy the text. And the Masoretes have been doing this since um, 200 BC. It's just that we didn't have any of those copies. We just had copies from 1000 AD. So they've been doing it for a long, 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 long time. We just didn't have any of them. And then the young shepherd boy wanders into a cave, which by the way, like this cave is tiny. Yeah. Like you could fit a well, I saw the picture, so don't ask me why I'm thinking of this, but I, you fit like a bottle of whiskey in there. Okay. What? Oh, wow. Like, that is not a human-sized cave. That is a bottle of whiskey-sized cave. <laughs> wow. um, oh. Some of them are a little bit bigger than that. But yeah, that, that kind of cave where a little shepherd boy could fit, get in and reach something out. Awesome. Yeah. So that's the Qumran, the Essene community, the Essenes who withdrew from first century Judaism, expecting their Messiah to come, and their copying down their Old Testament and stored it in caves for us to find 1900 years later. So a lot of um, so okay so there's something called textual criticism. Criticism is not a bad word in this case. Criticism is the work of comparing different manuscripts of ancient documents. Okay? So textual criticism doesn't only exist for the Old Testament and New Testament, it exists for any sort of classic or ancient document. Um, and what textual criticism tries to do is get us back as close as we can to the autograph. What was the original copy that was said? Because there's that 2%. There are differences between what the Masoretes had and what they were in the Dead Sea Scrolls. There are, and it's differences of, sometimes it's punctuation, sometimes it's where a vowel marking is, um, sometimes it's a word here or there, or a tense, or, um, you know, is it past or present or future, some of those things. There are some differences. And textual criticism is trying to figure out what was probably the original. And you can go 
study that for the rest of your life and, and never get to the bottom of it. Uh, so we're going to do some show and tell. This is a copy of um, the Biblia Hebraica. Um, and this is, for the most part, the Masoretic text. So what the Masoretes have copied, this is, for the most part, what we use to translate the Hebrew Bible into English translations and whatever translation in the world. Um, and then on the bottom, uh, what I want you to look at is you'll see all of this complete thing that will look like gibberish to you. Um, mostly looks like gibberish to me too, to be honest. But what it is, is, is textual criticism. It's comparing all the different manuscripts that we have, because there are thousands of them, of, okay, this one has this marking, and this one has that marking, and the majority have this first one, but a minority has the second one, but the minority is older, so we're going to go with the older one as opposed to the newer one. So, uh, you know, just do a little bit of show and tell with that. That's the work of textual criticism. We're, now this, the Old Testament, even though it's older, is relatively easier because the Jews were so careful about maintaining the text. Um, the New Testament, different story. New Testament, you have the autograph, you have something closer to what you think of as modern authorship. Uh, Paul, maybe with Timothy, maybe with somebody else, sits down and writes a letter. Uh, John sits down and writes his dream or his vision. The Gospels are a little bit more like what we talked about with editors and contributors. A good example of this is the book of Mark. Uh, we know from a church historian a couple centuries later um, that Mark's primary source was Peter. Uh, so Mark probably is running around having adventures with Peter, spreading the Gospel, and starts collecting the stories that Peter has before Peter dies. Tell me what it was like being with Jesus. And Mark, who, as far as we know, is probably a wealthy individual, probably, uh, well, he was apparently literate because he knew how to write, um, starts collecting all of these stories from Peter and starts writing them down. And the church historian who talks about this, a guy named Eusebius, uh, says specifically of the Gospel of Peter, Mark didn't really try to put it in any sort of order. He just wrote down whatever Peter told him as Peter thought of it. Or maybe Peter's preaching, and he says, hey, this one time I was with Jesus, and Jesus uh, went to my mother-in-law's house, and uh, my mother-in-law was sick, and I said, Jesus, please don't heal her. And, Peter, and Jesus does it anyway. Um, and so Mark writes it down, maybe a nicer version of that. So Eusebius knows about this story, knows that Mark him hangs out with Peter, writes down a gospel. Um... Can I erase this? This Old Testament sign? What do they call the Old Testament? Or is that only what it's called? If you're a Jew, you call it um, the Hebrew Scriptures or the Tanakh. Or you call it the Bible. Um, if you're a not a non-religious scholar working on it, you probably call it the Hebrew Bible. We call it the Old Testament. Christians call it the Old Testament. We call it what? The Old Testament. Um. So there's Mark. Mark has 661 verses. 606 show up in Matthew. <laughs> and 300. 350 show up in Luke. The most common theory is that Mark 
wrote his gospel first. Matthew and Luke had access to Mark and wrote down their gospels. Matthew and Luke have 250 verses in common that are not in Mark. Okay? Are you tracking with me? Mm -hmm. 661 verses in Mark, 606 of which show up in Matthew. So Matthew basically copies most of Mark, 350 of which show up in Luke. Luke copies about half of Mark. Matthew and Luke have 250 verses in common that are not in Mark. Following? <coughs> Diane? Yeah, Matthew and Luke. Matthew, Matthew and Luke have mm -hmm. a chunk in common. Mm -hmm. It's not in Mark. Not in Mark. So they are more in Matthew than Mark. Yes. This is something called Q. Q is a German, re represents a German word. Well, means source. And these 250 verses that Matthew and Luke have in common that are not Mark tell us that there was Mark and then there was Q. And Q was something that Matthew and Luke had to start pulling together their gospel. Because remember, there are editors and there are contributors. Matthew and Luke are serving as editors of these different sources. Mark, who had the eyewitness of Peter, and then whatever this is, they could pull as a source as well. Following... What did you say the Q meant? Q means source. Well, well thank German you. for source. Hi. What? What? Repeat. I. It's German for source. Source. Commonly referred to as Q. Remember, editors, contributors. Yes. When you said they had access to Mark, do yep. you mean they had access to what he wrote or access to the proof? Good question. And that's a, that's a historical guess. Okay. So, either they had access to an oral tradition okay. that was being passed on very, very carefully because 606 verses that are nearly identical to Mark in Matthew tells you they either someone's being very careful with the oral tradition, say this exactly, or Matthew the composer of Matthew, the editor of Matthew, had access to an actual document, a scroll or a papyrus or a codes um, of Mark, so he could, oh, I like this part, and I'm going to arrange it a little bit differently. I like this part. I like this part. I don't like 61 minus 6. You know, 54 verses. I'll do my own thing. Um, and Luke doing the same thing. He takes 350 verses of Mark. Not quite word for word, but almost word for word. Puts it in his gospel. And then there's these 250 verses that Matthew and Luke have in common that <coughs> they're pulling from. That's the Q idea. And then Matthew has 300 unique verses. Luke has 550 unique verses. It's, by the way, this is just one historical theory. Any critical thinkers out here think of a way to pull this apart? If they go for it, <laughs> if Matthew and Luke have 250 in common that are not in Mark, yeah, but there's only a difference of 60. There's only a difference of the 50, 55 verses between Mark and Matthew. Yeah, the math, the math doesn't add up because there's more verses in Matthew. There's more than 661 in Matthew. More okay. than 661. I don't think they all told the same stories. Did some eliminate? Like, yep. um, one of the, some of the Gospels don't have the same stories. Yes, exactly. Some are telling different things. Mark, for instance, doesn't have <coughs> Sermon on the Mount, the attitudes. Matthew will do. Now, the other theory that's out there is that Matthew's copying from Luke or Luke's copying from Matthew. That's a possibility. So it doesn't have to be true. just a theory. Mary asks, why do we care? Um, <laughs> right. Some are going to say that it's all made up. Yeah. That some people got together a couple decades after Jesus' death 
and needed to start concocting a religion around it. Um, but then when you start looking at all of these different similarities and contrasts, because there are, the four Gospels are not identical, and a little historical aside, there was a document that was passed around in the 3rd century to, oh no, 300s, 300s AD, and it was what was called a synopsis or a harmony of the Gospels. One book that took all four Gospels and squished it down into one. And the people never accepted it as a gospel. They wanted the four Gospels because they each shed a little bit different light on the person and character of Jesus, who is the representation of God, who is God in the flesh. Because it was their, their take on it. Yeah, it was a harmonization of it. It was squishing it down. Because there are differences. Matthew uh, has Jesus riding into Jerusalem comically on both a colt and a donkey. Jesus had a very wide girth, I guess. <laughs> Whereas, yeah, one foot on each stir I don't know. Stir um, yeah, it was, yeah, it was a, more of a circus ride. Whereas Mark and Luke have Jesus riding on either a colt or a donkey. Um, and we can get into the reasons for all that later. But each of these authors or editors have their reasons for doing that. Um, so the, the church rejected the idea of harmonizing the four Gospels. They had all four Gospels. Um, it, it, part, of their, part of their story. Um, let's see. Where am I? Uh, but you also had Peter, Peter and Paul and the other New Testament writers with their autographs. Um, and the same process happens. You still don't have a printing press. You still don't have Xerox machines. It's all through copying by hand all of these different manuscripts of the gospel. Um, the Byzantine tradition is our largest chunk of manuscripts. Um, however, it's also the most recent. This is what the King James was translated from. It's from a Byzantine collection of manuscripts. Also dates around, I erased it, a thousand-ish AD. This is what's called the majority text. As time went on, we found, for instance, the Alexandrian Library and the Alexandrian School this is our oldest collection of manuscripts. I'm sorry, did you say King James? No. The King James was translated from this. Okay, that's what I thought you said, the register. The Alexandrian school is the oldest, but also our smallest chunk of manuscripts. And some of these are like 100 AD, 130 AD, some of these manuscripts. Um, they're very, very, very old and very, very, very close to the original. The Hebrew Bible, we're still, you know, even with the Dead Sea Scrolls, you're still a thousand or two thousand years away from the, the, the autograph, the original, original. Uh, New Testament, we're only 30, 40, have documents only 30, 40 years removed from the, from the autograph, from the original. Uh, Textual criticism, again, does the work of taking all of these different copies and copies of copies of copies and compares and, and contrasts and tries to find what is the closest. Now, what about John? What about John? Well, <laughs> what are you talking about? He's cute. Not tonight on CBS. <laughs> You know, Mark had this many, and Matthew had that many, and Luke had that many, but they had that mm, yes. access to Mark's first. Yep. How come Matthew is first in the Bible if Mark's was written first and the others had access to it? Do you know? Matthew was um, very early on considered like, uh, there was a term for it. It was like the golden, it's the golden gospel or something like that. It was considered the greatest of the four Gospels early on in church history. Really? Um, and Mark was actually considered kind of a piece of junk. <laughs> uh, but yet Matthew copied Mark. <laughs> but most people didn't... It wasn't until 
after the Enlightenment and we started doing textual criticism um, and treating the Bible a little bit more like a science experiment, that that was realized. That there are very, very good arguments for thinking that Mark was the original and the oldest. Um, most of church history saw Matthew as the first one and the other ones copied after him. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Those are the synoptics. And then there's John. <laughs> Which is a very, very, very different book. Okay, more show and tell. Does anybody have a problem if I keep you 10 minutes over to me? Okay, this is called a synopsis of the four Gospels. And it takes the four Gospels and puts them in four columns and does some of the work of comparing and contrasting all the different chunks of the Gospel story. And <laughs> the, the part that's great is that the fourth column, John, there are sections where it just completely disappears because there's, John doesn't do the same thing as the synoptics, and chunks where it's only John and the other three just disappear because there's nothing like it in the other three. So, show and tell with that. And it's a great, great tool to have because you see Luke loves to talk about uh, women and slaves and those who are like more low in society. Matthew tends to do a little bit more work with Judaism and quoting Hebrew scripture. Uh, Mark is very short and to the point and out of order. And Mark constantly uses the word immediately as if everything happened in one day in Jesus' life. And John is just kind of, you know, he's, the, I don't know, he's playing in the mud or something. Like, he's just doing his own thing. Like, he's just doing, doing completely his own thing. Um, okay, let me... If I'm ruining anybody's view of scripture, let me try to fix it for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking Matthew was first because that was the father's lineage. Oh, sure. You know, it's the that male and female thing because the book is the other. Yeah, right. And there are scholars who argue every which way. The majority of scholars will say Mark <coughs> is the first one. Um, no, in our yeah, in ours yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, that. and Matthew does the same have that have that Old Testament continuity with it. It starts with the genealogy, which is a very Old Testament thing to do. Okay, so there are lots of different classic ancient documents. Um, so there's one called the Gaelic War, and this comes from Caesar, like the original Caesar, um, Julius Caesar, and it's that story. And um, we have nine to ten good manuscripts of, of the history of Julius Caesar. And um, they, the oldest one that we have comes from 980. Okay, you tracking with me? So somebody way back in Julius Caesar's day wrote the story of Julius Caesar and the Gaelic War. There are copies of copies of copies of copies. We have nine to ten good ones, and the oldest one comes from 980, which is a thousand years after Julius Caesar. Um, there's a, a Roman history by a guy named Livy, and uh, we've got 20 manuscripts, and the oldest one is from... 580. Um, we'll give you another one. History of Tacitus. So another Roman history. Uh, we've got... So we know there are 14 volumes. We only have four of them. And they're entirely based on two manuscripts. From the... About a thousand AD. And again, this is all a thousand years after the fact, five hundred years after the fact, a thousand years after the fact. Nine to ten manuscripts, twenty manuscripts, two good manuscripts. New Testament. We have fifty three hundred manuscripts of the Old Testament. Of the New Testament. Two excellent 
manuscripts, complete entire copies of the New Testament from around 500 AD, and then uh, fragments and hundreds of fragments, not just a couple, that are from 100 to 200 AD. There's no classic scholar who doubts the, I don't know, existence, the veracity, the, I don't know, the story of how we got these, even though there's only 9 to 10, there's only 20, there's only 2. New Testament, we have hundreds and thousands of copies. Two excellent for 500, just a few fragments from 100 to 200. Um, and they agree, 98, and there's that number, percent of the time. About a percentage and a half um, yield to textual criticism. In other words, you can solve the puzzle of what happened by comparing manuscripts to each other. So quite often, um, somebody will, well, okay, here's a thing to note about the, the New Testament. Written in all capital letters, no spaces, no punctuation. What? Wow. So if you're Paul and you're writing a letter, or you have a secretary doing it for you, all capital letters, no spaces, no punctuation. Because papyrus is very expensive. <laughs> you gotta save space. I don't. Sure? So then, as people began to copy these manuscripts, and papyrus becomes more available, etc., then you start inserting the spaces. Then you start inserting the punctuation. Some of the variants, textual variants, or what they're called, is when someone puts the space in a different place, or <laughs> someone puts the punctuation in a different place, a comma instead of a period. Um, I can't think of an example off the top of my head, but if you accidentally shift a letter the wrong way, so it ends one way and starts another, those are the kind of textual variants that we have. Most of those, that one and a half percent, can be solved with textual criticism of, oh, okay, this one from 1000 AD, the comma's over here, but we have a copy that's a couple hundred years older, and you see the comma's over there, so we're going to go with this reading. And that was the, that's the idea of what was in the Bible that I handed you. Here's a Greek New Testament. This is called a critical edition of the Greek New Testament. And uh, much the same thing. We'll do it. I'll start with you instead of over there. Sorry. Uh, much the same thing of doing all that comparing and contrasting with all the different copies. Of the entire text of 20,000 lines of Greek New Testament, there are about 40 lines that are in serious scholarly debate of even comparing all of our 5,300 manuscripts, there are still about 40 lines that you could argue one way or the other. None of which affect doctrine or like, it's not like one of the lines is Jesus was resurrected. Oops, no, one of them was Jesus died again. Like, no, there's nothing like that. It's all very minor kind of things. The prominent story of both Old Testament and New Testament transmission is... It's miraculous that you had copies of copies of copies of copies of copies that are thousands of years old being copied by hand, and we're at 99 and a half percent. Jeez. Um, so we're between documents that are, and you think thousands of years apart from each other. Thousands of years apart from each other. And the fact that it started with storytellers. And it started with storytellers. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's no accident. Right. So the, the manuscripts on the Gaelic War, the yeah. history, that kind of stuff would go into like our kids' history books? Yeah, exactly. Of course it would. And that's yeah, no one doubts the existence of Julius Caesar. <laughs> or when that. No one doubts the existence of Caesar Augustus. No one doubts the existence of, you know, pick your historical figure, even though there are far more manuscripts. And we've got an embarrassment of riches. What about drawings? I mean, we talk about 
Hebrew, you know, the languages. Yeah. But is there anything out there with drawings? Yeah, there's lots of art. Um, um, of the stories? Of the story? Yeah, I mean, most, I mean, I'm just... most Hebrew art was destroyed in all the exiles, yeah. um, like early Old Testament art. Um, Christian art, most Christian art. Well, okay, let me show you what I'm doing. Well, you know how like they'll show like in a movie on the cave walls, yeah, of, you yes, know, like yeah. <laughs> with um, the animals and the men, and I'm just like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you one example. Some people call them good drawers. Oh, they could draw, they could write. <clears throat> So this is um, second century. You all see that. And here you can see um, it's all capitals. Uh, it says Alexa Minos worships his God. What do you notice about this figure? Looks like a crucifixion. Mm -hmm. And what's being crucified? An animal. Horse. 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 Sometimes an animal. A donkey. Horse with the mm -hmm. well, the body part. Oh, with the animal. But it also looks like it's yep. It's a god. Yep. It's a god being crucified. Yep. Uh, our God, Jesus. Uh, it's uh, it's actually mocking Christians oh. because no one would worship someone on a cross. You idiot. Ooh. Yeah. Rome dealt with that fool, that insurrectionist, and uh, Alexa Minos is an idiot for worshiping what he thinks is God, and we're going to crudely depict him okay. as a naked donkey. Mm -hmm. Horsing around, yeah. yeah. So, not Christian art, it's actually anti-Christian art. Yeah. Um, but, from a very, very, again, within a hundred years of, of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, That's we how see... old that is, then? Yeah, this is 200s, so very early. Mm -hmm. Um... This is, you know, we see the cross, mm -hmm. symbol of Christianity, the crucifix, symbol of Christianity, and the fact that uh, Jesus is being called God. So even though they're making fun of it, it kind of... It helps it, right. prove some yeah. of the... Uh -huh. The idea that Jesus is God, some would claim was a, you know, 4th or 5th century invention. No. Um, the idea that the cross was a symbol of the Christian faith was a later invention. No. Um, yeah. So you do have some things yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. um, all right, I should cut you loose. We didn't even talk about Bible translations. But I'm going to give you a few handouts. Did you say Bible translations? Translations. Oh, translations. That's what I wanted to talk about. But <laughs> we'll I'm talk about it next time? Yeah, we can talk about it a little. Okay, for next week, um, okay, so this is like two pages, two pages, you've got two things to read, uh, one is on, is the, new, is the New Testament reliable, so again, I don't want any of this idea of textual criticism and all of that to like wreck your faith in the Bible. I want it to be the opposite. Um, and yeah, and then another article called Agassiz and the Fish, and this will move us at last into the actual work of Bible study. So next week we're gonna spend a little bit of time on translation, Bible translation. Uh, and then we'll do 
start working on how to observe the biblical text. Not anymore for Bible study that works yet. Thank you. Sorry I kept you over. Thank you. Thank you.